Welcome to Glow and Tell, a podcast about all things beauty, wellness, and business, sponsored by Artemis, the brand empowering the unsung heroes of beauty and wellness. Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Glow and Tell. I am your host, Delaney Allen Mills, VP of Brand at Artemis, and I am so lucky to be joined today by Nakre Pittman, who is one of our incredible product managers here at Artemis as well. I have had the absolute pleasure of knowing Nakre for almost three years now, which is really wild. Time really does fly when you're having fun. Um, <laughs> and- <laughs> Um, I just can't wait to speak to her on on various topics, Uh, but today we are going to be talking about how to build relationships sort of across the board in our personal and professional lives, um, sort of those important networking strategies, these things that are so important for us as we develop in our lives and in our careers. So Nakre, if you just want to give a little bit of an introduction to yourself, how you got to where you are now in your career journey, and then we can dive right into the episode. Absolutely. Thank you so much, too, for having me on this podcast. I am honored and I can't wait to have this discussion. Um, A little bit about me. So I am from Chicago, Illinois, and I started out with a primarily medical background. So coming from more so looking to be an OBGYN Mm. and go into the medical pathway and kind of transitioned over to the health and beauty sector. So I actually got my my bachelor's degree in pre-med at Aurora University, and then I got my master's degree in public administration at Aurora University as well. Not doing too much with that one, but that's okay. You can never have too much education. <laughs> um, and from there, I decided actually, I was like, okay, wow, I'm kind of in limbo. And because I had prepped my entire life to go to medical school, even from an early age, I was in multiple programs, my parents were very excited because at a young age, I expressed that I wanted to be a doctor. So they really wanted to make sure that they kind of nurtured that, um, that want and my natural craft for or ability to understand science, to really understand like medicine, the body and how that worked. And so it was a little disappointing for them when I decided like, Hey, not going to medical school anymore. Um, And also it was a little disappointing to myself because I had, that was my passion for so long and kind of Mm. pivoted. And so after leaving my master's program, I was like, okay, well, I have to do something and I don't know what exactly it is I want to do. And around that time, I struggled really bad with cystic acne all over my Mm. face. Like I'm talking pustules, I'm talking like not everything, like painful. Like I didn't want to leave the house. I didn't want to be touched. It was just so, so bad. And I was actually the only one out of my three sisters that even struggled with acne. So Mm. I also felt like no one understood me because they're like, you're being dramatic. Like, why don't you want to like leave the house? And like, you just don't understand. Like, unless you have acne, it's hard for you to understand that. So I kind of did a bunch of research and Mm. looking into how to fix acne for myself. And I was like, oh, well, I could become, you know, a dermatologist. And I was like, that's still not really what I want to do. Mm. And found what an esthetician was after seeking out an esthetician and going to get facials literally routinely every two to three weeks, trying to like combat this terrible acne. And she was trying like throwing just everything at it. Nothing was working. And I'm like, okay, well, I need to understand the skin for myself a little bit deeper And so that's kind of what stirred up the passion for aesthetic school. And so then I went to aesthetic school, um, graduated in six months. And then after that, I was determined to go to Hand in Stone because that's where I initially had all of my treatments. And I love the atmosphere. I love the provider care. I just loved everything about Hand in Stone. So I was like, that's where I want to go. That's where I want to kind of nurture and start this journey. And then the goal was to own my own practice eventually. So After being at Hand in Stone, I kind of accelerated quickly there. So I became not only like the lead trainer there, but also like um, also was in a little bit of management. So was Mm -hmm. responsible for hiring, training and developing not only the front staff, 
of the spa, but also for estheticians. Mm -hmm. And then also I became a trainer for one of the Artemis devices, which is why I got or how I got introduced rather and fell in love with that and fell in love with the trainer that was from Artemis. And I was like, oh my God, I, I like love everything about that company as well. And so when I saw a job posting, I was like, oh my God, like I have to, I have to have, like, I love Hand in Stone and I love my clients. I love what I currently do, but this is more aligned in like the trajectory of where I want to go. So I applied and reconnected with you. And I was like, this is just, this is just so perfect. So that's kind of the high level quick and fast of my background. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Nakray, for that introduction. I think uh, we could probably go into so many different topics that you've raised because so many of them, I see so many different tracks of conversations that would be so fascinating for our listeners. So I'm really excited that we're going to be having you back on the podcast for many episodes to come, I'm sure. Um, but a couple of things that I did want to touch on just off the bat, you know, I think it's so beautiful that you came to the aesthetic and beauty space from such a robust clinical and health background. It's something that we see relatively often. And I do see people that are so interested in, in that side of things really entering in. But also the thing I wanted to highlight is that you really came here from this personal mission point of having really experienced not only the physical effects of something like acne, but also the, the mental impact, you know, and I will share that I see you in that and I completely relate. I also dealt with extremely painful cystic acne that made me feel the same way. It just knocks your confidence on the floor. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if this was also your experience, but mine came completely out of, seemingly out of nowhere. I know now mm -hmm. that it was a major hormonal imbalance that was happening for me. So it, it did take time and um, that professional consultation for me to really get to a place where I am now, where I know how to work with my body, work with my skin, lifestyle, product. Um, but it is something that is, it's such a beautiful story that you came so full circle that you sought help at Hand in Stone, that you ended up going there, you found your passion in aesthetics. And I really see it in, in everything that you do. It shines through. And really on the topic of our call today and of this episode is, you know, this idea of, of building relationships, uh, both personally and professionally and networking and how to really build strong lifetime relationships. And so something I want to share with our listeners about you is that when I first met you, it was at a train the trainer event that we were doing that Artemis was hosting at, at Hand and Stone. And the thing about you that really stood out to me was just your incredible passion that just shone through everything that you were doing, everything that you were saying, how you were interacting. You had this amazing, just quiet confidence and you asked just such brilliant questions. You were so engaged, you were so present and it left such an impact. Um, so much so that, you know, I remember raving about you to our team when I came back. And it's something that when you reached out and, and put in an application, you know, that impact that you make on someone when you first meet them either in person or when you're interacting with them virtually, that then creates a thread that, you know, leads through to, to bigger opportunities or different opportunities, you know, to your point. So um, I think where I want to start for this episode is, is talking a little bit more about your experience um, in spa and as a licensed esthetician in spa and also, you know, from your healthcare background and working at a healthcare practice. Um, what were the steps or the um, the important um, behaviors that you would say that you leveraged to build lasting and emotionally impactful relationships with your clients or the patients at the practice? That's a great question. And I have a lot of experience and great influential people around me that were great role models. Mm -hmm. So number one, primarily being my mother, both my parents are great role models, but specifically talking about like relationship building. Mm -hmm. When you when you think of someone or look up the word like gregarious or like just talkative, my mother's picture should be <laughs> right <laughs> right underneath it because she can yeah, talk for she's a stranger to no one she will talk to everyone and you'll love her by the end of the conversation 
And so watching her growing up, we have extremely similar personalities and dispositions. So like, I'm basically just her mirrored, a little tempered down because I have a little bit of my father who's very introverted and kind of self reflects. But also from my time where I shadowed actually an OBGYN for Mm -hmm. roughly five to six years. And I started off in that position kind of hounding to get in the door because I wanted to be an OBGYN. So I was like calling. My mom was like, never stop calling, keep calling. So I kept calling to make sure that, you know, they saw my application so that Mm -hmm. I could be considered for an admin role. And so it started off kind of an internship because I was so young that they were were kind of like, "Hmm, we don't know if you're capable of doing this. So I started off in an admin role at an OBGYN office, and it was a private practice. And so in a private practice and in a smaller, like, I guess you could say small company, essentially, just Mm -hmm. in a medical company, things are kind of always haywire. So Mm -hmm. what started out as admin grew to admin, medical, medical um, assistant, grew to personal assistant, executive assistant, grew to so many different things. And the doctor that I specifically worked for, she was so thorough in everything that she did. Um, when you people specifically sought her out, because when they came in for a woman's health checkup, it wasn't just your typical, oh, let's get a pap smear, let's just do a checkup. It was let's run blood work to see mm. why things are the way they are. Let's do autonomic stress testing to see why Mm -hmm. if stress is playing a role into what we're what's being seen in your condition so she she took approach of a 360 approach it wasn't just like let's treat or put a band-aid on a symptom we're wanting to get into the root cause so seeing that and understanding also the education that she had and she also input into the staff I grew and learned so much from her even so much so like I, I was basically her executive assistant and mm-hmm. was there through so much. I got to see how she, you know, did bedside and talked to her clients. And also, even in surgeries, I got to see so many different cosmetic gynecology sur- sur- surgeries, actually. Um, and then even to the point I was able to see her deliver a baby. I wasn't supposed to be in the room, <laughs> but I got to also help deliver a baby. But that was kind of like the starting point of, me understanding the importance of being thorough and how people will pay for someone who is thorough. So the reason why I say that is well, why that's relevant is because she was a cosmetic gynecologist and also Mm -hmm. a concierge gynecologist. Mm. So people would pay a premium on top Mm -hmm. of their insurance to come and see her. So they're paying like, you know, $350 just to see her because she's so thorough. So I was like, that's she's on to something. <laughs> so I kind of took that mindset mm-hmm. when I had my own clients, when I was seeing um, my clients at Hand and Stone. So when I first started, it was kind of rough because when you first start, you're kind of in like that limbo area where you're mm-hmm. trying to gain traction and trying to find like your steady database, I guess you could say, or Rolodex of clients. And I really would say like, it doesn't, you don't get steady until like month five or six, where you have like people who are requesting to see you where they're like, die hard. No, it can be no one else. And that makes you feel really good. So I would say I made sure to do little things to differentiate myself. So we would have Mm -hmm. these, um, what you call consultation cards. And Mm -hmm. in them, they were, they requested for us to use them, but not every provider did. But in those consultation cards, I would write little affirming notes in them. You're beautiful. You look amazing. Or maybe a little like tidbit of what we talked about during our session, just something to make them feel, you know, empowered after leaving I and then giving that. them also detailed instructions on how to use the products and why they're using them that way. And then also lifestyle changes. So it wasn't just like, okay, I want you to come in to see me for this service. And then also I want you to buy these products. It's let's change things from once again, that 360 approach. Mm. Let's look at lifestyle. Let's look at what you're eating food wise. Of course, I'm not a dietitian. I can't like tell you to do anything, but Mm -hmm. I know certain things will cause inflammation in the body. Mm -hmm. So let's possibly change these things. But of course, speak to your, uh, your health provider. So taking that approach, I think really differentiated myself and also being authentic. Mm. So one thing that I, I struggled with early because like I wanted to be everyone's friend is when people didn't like me. So mm. it felt 
like if and I and I had probably a handful of you know clients maybe I counted probably one hand that were just like eh, you know they maybe they didn't like me and sometimes that feels like a personal attack it's mm. like oh you know they didn't like me because I didn't do this or because right. I said this or it could be they just don't like you because you're not their cup of tea and that's okay because mm-hmm. you're not everyone's cup of tea and there's no harm no foul there's nothing it's not a personal attack and so sometimes I had to like remind myself of that to not get beat down by like people not liking me because you can't be liked by everyone. That's it's just it's literally not possible. That was a chance for me to grow and really look at myself and say like okay, you're not doing this to be validated also by other people. You're doing this to help other people. So even if nobody likes you, but you're still helping people, that's perfectly okay. So I would say not only the 360 approach, but being genuine and being okay with not being liked by everyone is okay, but Mm -hmm. still being authentic to yourself. So not changing yourself or trying to acquiesce to what someone else wants you to be is going to make all the difference because when you try to acquiesce or change who you are, people can spot a fake from a mile away. So you have to be authentic and confident in who you are so that you can help people essentially. And I think for me, confidence, I know we kind of briefly touched on that, Mm -hmm. but confidence from an early age I've always been extremely confident but when Mm -hmm. I got to like my I would say like high school Mm -hmm. early college my confidence was like kind of shaken a little bit (laughs) through other you know extrinsic factors of you know life Mm -hmm. um acne also did not help with that Mm -hmm. so (laughs) my confidence was a little I became a little bit more um not as outspoken Mm -hmm. um and more reserved but still like I was still always sure of myself but I just wasn't as like when I looked in the mirror I'm like okay I don't look beautiful today and like Mm. that'll just be okay um but I but as I got older and I'm still growing in this because I don't think that you ever arrive at full confidence I think it's always a constant like learning curve yeah journey journey is a great way It's it's a great way it's a journey you'll never fully arrive and I think that's okay but as I've gotten older, one thing that I've learned is you don't have to be the loudest to be seen. Oh, and so such a good something one. about me is when I was younger, like I would I would want to make sure that everyone saw me, everyone know like who who is the cry, who is this woman? So mm. I would be the loudest in the room and I'd be like, you're going to know me, you're going to see me. But when you're confident and you're able to hold yourself in a certain standard in a certain way you don't have to be seen people will see you Mm. so as I got older I learned not only to find confidence in who I was but also like using my faith as an anchor point of knowing Mm -hmm. who I was and also my family I have a great support system so people are constantly reminding me like no you are you are powerful you are intelligent you are this even when I feel like I'm not like I'm constantly reminded of that so it's hard for me to stay in like you know, a valley of being low, but everybody has, you know, those valleys where you might not feel the best. So that's kind of like, I hope I answered that. I probably went a couple of different like avenues. (laughs) You absolutely did. And I feel that our listeners will take so much value from what you've said, because so many people can relate. I know I can absolutely relate. Um, yeah, I, de- I definitely want to pick up on a few things that you've said because there's so many key sort of bits that you that you've highlighted on. I think the first piece is is this mentorship element or or really seeking and mirroring people that you see exhibiting traits that you really want to step into. So you highlighted, you know, your mother from an early age, you seeing that, you seeing her, you know, kind of having this big personality that really was infectious that, you know, she's leaving friends with everyone. And then in a professional capacity as well, you identifying this mentor, which Mm -hmm. I have to say mentorship for anyone, regardless of your age is one of the most powerful tools you can use in your life. Because when we have someone that we look at that we can say, they are moving in the world. They are operating in the way that I want to move in the world, that I want to operate. And it's not, to your point, it's not about this um, this kind of lack of authenticity. It's more, I see myself stepping into the bigger version of myself that is this. And I see this person doing that. And it's so interesting that you highlight this, this element of the thorough nature because 
if I had to boil you down to some adjectives, thorough would be very, very high on that list. Um, 360 <laughs> approach would be very, very high on that list. Very bold and confident would also be very high on that list. So I love that you also have that level of self-awareness and also have developed into that from that mentorship. I think that's just so it just shows the power of it. Um, and I do, I would tell people, you know, the, the, the word that's often used for um, identifying these types of people in our lives is, is looking for our expanders. So mm. looking at people that when we're around them, we are expanding, that they represent for us where we want to go, what we mm -hmm. want to step into. And I love that you had that opportunity for mentorship. And I, I love that you shared that you, you know, you helped to deliver a baby. You weren't meant to be there, but you helped <laughs> and you got to see really all sides of this. And you also highlight this incredibly important point that I've definitely spoken to before as well on the podcast in previous episodes, which is, you know, you're speaking to, to this mentor who people pay a premium to come yes. and receive a service from someone that they feel that they have built a relationship with and that they feel is going to really deliver the service to them in the way that they really appreciate and enjoy. Absolutely. You also highlight something that I think Again, I cannot reemphasize the importance of for anyone of any age in any profession, in any personal capacity as well, which is something that my mentor reminds me of a lot, um, which is that you are not for everyone. Everyone's not for you. Yes. And I think that often we can get really tripped up in trying to prove ourselves to the people mm -hmm. that we are just not for. And what happens with that is you end up spending all this energy trying to prove yourself to people that, that you're just not for. And, and that's absolutely fine because not everyone is for you either. And what that does is we start to spin our wheels and all of that energy when we have so many people that we are for, that, that are, are excited to come in and get a service from us or are excited to come to work and get to talk to us. I mean, you and I, you know, as you know, and our listeners are now going to get clued into this. Nakrae and I spent um, probably about an hour and a half chatting before we started recording this episode because we just genuinely love to be in each other's energy. And so, yes. you know, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of people that would but much rather do m many other things than be on a call with me for an hour. <laughs> no, it's always a joy and pleasure to talk to you. And you and I think also like for you, Delaney, you're also so easy to talk to because it's like there is you're very much like my mother in that way. There's not a gap to be like this in the conversation. Like, we can have a conversation about 80 different things in a span of like 15 minutes. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that this is something I wanted to highlight where I, I love that actually you and I are different in this way in that you speak to the fact that you were confident. You've always been confident that you were confident from a young age, that your mom was just very bold and very confident and, um, you know, very outspoken outgoing and very much um, that way. And something I, I may have shared on a, on a previous episode, but maybe not, that usually surprises people, um, given how much I do love to talk, um, is that I actually was the complete polar opposite. I was debilitatingly shy when I was younger, um, up until probably, I would say, I was in my early 20s and it's, so it's, <laughs> it's something that is really shocking for a lot of people because I am someone that is so outgoing and is so confident now. You know, I definitely, to your point, it's a journey. I'm still on the path with the confidence and it's just something that like anything, it's a muscle. And if you are someone who is shyer and is looking at people who are more confident or more bold or more um, outspoken or just, you know, generally more outgoing in, in that way, and you're wanting to step into that more and it feels inaccessible to you, the practical tips that I would give to you is just, just to practice. Um, it's really, you know, again, something, this is going back to the importance and the value of mentorship. It's something my mentor would say is, you know, say hi to one new person every day. Mm -hmm. When you're in the coffee okay. shop, say hi. When you see someone who has, you know, a, a sweater on that you really love, say, I really love your sweater. And 
I think when we're talking, especially in this episode about networking and building relationships, those opportunities where you are just saying hi to one new person and with no expectations of what might come from that conversation, you are opening up a door and you are opening up an opportunity. And I think that, you know, what I will add to Nakray's um, sort of sharing of, of her experience um, with patients and with clients as well. Um, I similarly did manage a um, an acupuncture practice before I came to Artemis. So I also was building relationships with patients and I also um, was delivering treatments and um, sort of managing our, a cryotherapy and wellness practice as well. And so I had experience both from a, an aesthetic perspective and from a health and wellness perspective perspective of, of building these relationships. And, you know, what I would say is every morning when you wake up and you go into the spa or you go into the practice or you go into whatever job or business you're working in, we have a choice every day as to how we're going to be there. And, you know, it's not to say that there's any good or bad way to show up. I mean, obviously, objectively, you know, we can, we can say that there are, you know, we should be kind and and compassionate with, with the others, but you know, the thing that I think is so important to recognize is that you can choose how you're showing up every day. You can choose to show up with presence. You can choose to show up and really meet people where they are and start to develop those relationships. And you can also be attuned to other people and their personalities. And it might be that they're not as much a talker, that they really need to receive and just have space held for them. Mm -hmm. And it might be that they just need to be coaxed out of their shell a little bit and they are shyer. And afterwards they will thank you for the conversation that you've had. And, you know, I'll just give a quick anecdote before I ask you the next question to cry, but I had a client back in 2017 with one of our Artemis devices that I was working with. And she came in to me um, ahead of, I believe it was her 50th birthday and she was going on a big trip. And she just, she and I built this beautiful relationship. You know, every time she came in, I was asking her about the plans that she had made and, you know, how things were were moving forward and her daughter. And she had such a beautiful relationship with her daughter. And we would just talk about her life and what was going on for her. And she and I are still in touch to this day, I love you that. know, yeah. and it's just a really beautiful thing. And I got to see how her confidence transformed across the delivery of these treatments, you know, now seven years ago, and she is just killing it. And, you know, I am always commenting on her posted photos with fire emojis and like, (laughs) just, yes, girl, you know, and it's, it's one of those things where when you choose to build a relationship with people, you have that capability to do so. Um, So I think it's just, it speaks to the incredible impact that we are able to have if we choose to do so, because we can also choose to to clock in, clock out. You know, if we, if we choose to not be present, we won't be present. If we choose to, you know, go in and, and just mindlessly deliver a service, then, then, you know, that's the experience. But to your point, being authentic to you, if you're someone that loves to to build relationships with people, then choose that for yourself and also find those around you, your colleagues or others or mentors, your boss to, to really mirror and really see if they can help you to develop. Um, So that, that's just what I would add to the amazing things that you've shared. So now, <laughs> so now that we have started talking about, you know, this kind of that environment, right, of being in the workplace with colleagues, with a boss, you know, what would you give in terms of, you know, potentially some some anecdotes or even just 
advice to our listeners about how to develop relationships with your colleagues and, and with the people that you're working both with and for? Because I think it is a little bit different, obviously, than when it we're is. building relationships with clients. And so I would love to hear your feedback on that as we kind of move through these different pieces of our, our personal and professional lives. Yes. And I'm so glad that you also made like the distinction because it, there is a little bit of a distinction. There are a lot of overlap, but there mm -hmm. is a little bit of a different approach. And I think for me, um, and I actually do have a funny story um, going back, um, but you know, you know, I'll start with that story. So when I worked at this um, OBGYN office, I had one coworker and I'm the type of person where I'm usually friends with everyone. Like everyone mm -hmm. loves me. I'm always showing up. I'm the bubbly person. Mm -hmm. Like we can talk about anything. You can tell me anything. You know, it's a great time. We're going to get our work done and we're going to also have fun. Yeah. Both. <laughs> and <laughs> one of my coworkers for, now mind you, I was working here for about five years. Mm -hmm. um, for the first two and a half years, she would not speak to me. Mm. Um, I would, she would come in every morning and I would say, good morning. She would not speak to me. She would not acknowledge me. I would ask for help. She would not help me. Also coming in to a new space, I was, you know, fresh into, uh, was I in college? I think I was either leaving college or, I, no, I think I was probably like in the middle of college roughly. Mm -hmm. And um, starting like my first like professional job, I didn't have a lot of experience of being in, in that type of office space. So there was a lot that I did not know. Also right. learning, you know, two different EMR systems was a little challenging and just the way of how things work. So I got virtually no help. So I had to figure out a lot of things on my own and I would go home and I'm like, why doesn't I would I would literally sit. And I'm like, why doesn't she like me? Like, I'm always so nice to her. Mm. I go out of my way to speak with her and I never stopped speaking to her. I never stopped being nice. I never stopped respecting her and come to find out slowly, but surely she started like latching on to me. She would start telling me her stories and she was going through a lot of trauma in her life. Like, and I think it might've been, and I mean, I can't speak for her, but it might've been hard for her to see someone who's so happy, so bubbly while she's going through something so hard and so trying. And I don't, and I think, she, and she told me like, it was, it was refreshing for me to like still, you know, reach out and still be nice and still be kind and not meet her with the same level of respect that she was meeting me with. And so I think that just goes to show that number one, when building like relationships among colleagues or even a superior or supervisor, it's important to have respect. And when I'm saying respect, it's not, I'm going to respect you because you're seemingly above me. I'm going to respect everyone in the same capacity. Um, and I've always been taught that. So I'm not going to show you more respect because you have a higher leadership role. I'm going to show you the same respect and, and I'm going to meet you with that same level of care, of team teamwork and collaboration, which leads me to my next point. It's important to work as a team. So even when you're in teams where you are leading a team or you are like responsible for managing or mentoring the team, because I've been in different spaces where I've had that opportunity as well, it's important to make sure that you're not just like, okay, I need you to do this, you to do this, you to do this. It's like, okay, these are your tasks that like, of course you have to do these, but how can I help you? How can I right. make sure that this is a collaborative environment? Is there anything that I can do? Is there anything that you know you need to do less of but really making sure that it's collaborative is important and that everyone's thoughts are being heard that latter part what i just mentioned is something i had to learn along the lines because mm -hmm. because i'm so sometimes overpowering i used to think you know <laughs> my ideas are the best ideas no one can really you know once my idea is laid out, that's it. <laughs> so yeah. I had to learn quickly that it's it's important to have, you know, diversity in mm -hmm. the ideas that are being re represented because that's how you get to, you know, breaking barriers of truly innovating or really creating and coming up with something new. So I think it's important to make sure that everyone feels like they have a seat at the table. Um, so respect, teamwork, collaboration, um, also actively listening. And then I would also say creating boundaries. So, and when you hear the word boundaries, you think like, oh, negative, like, but boundaries are good. So I think 
asserting like it's important for you to have you know friends within the workspace but also respecting other people's boundaries and then creating boundaries so whether that's like these are the things that I'm not willing to take on or vice versa so that this relationship can be strong is something that should be established or even respecting boundaries of you know times that someone might be out of office or not asking them for things because you see them you know just certain things like that but I think boundaries I'm a huge boundary setter um Mm -hmm. even not not in a professional setting only, but also personal, like you have to, you have to set the standard of how people will treat you. If you don't set a standard, they will treat you anyway. (laughs) So there has to be some type of precedent of standard that is set. And I think boundaries is a great way to do that. So I think that's kind of my approach to building relationships in a professional environment and then still just maintaining true to yourself. Once again, you might have people that don't like you or you don't like, and that's okay because you don't have to necessarily love the person that you're working with, but you can like and respect them. So I think there's there's a balance to make sure that, you know, once again, we have a respect, we're able to do things in a fun and effective way. But um, those would be my tips on how to navigate in like a professional setting. Yeah, I think you've highlighted on so many incredible points. And I'm just so glad as well that you started off with that story about your colleague that um, took a little bit longer and that you just had that consistency with and that you raised how much she appreciated that because it really does remind me of a, a commencement speech that I come back to again and again that David Foster Wallace delivered at Kenyon College. It's called This is Water. You can find the transcript or the video online, but it really is something that speaks to the fact that we just never know what someone else is going through. And you can apply this to all areas of your life whenever you're relating to other people. So whether it is sitting in traffic and someone is cutting you off (laughs) and whether it is at the grocery store, um, whether you are in the workplace, you just really don't know what people are going through. And it is something that just really begs from us to, or really sort of incentivizes us or should incentivize us as compassionate human beings to just take a step back and not over exert ourselves. So not kind of go and and pour and pour and pour, but to your point, just remain consistent and show up as ourselves. And to your point, you continue to just show up as yourself. You didn't let that energy impact you in the sense that you changed who you are fundamentally. You were yourself, but you were consistent. And I think that consistency is something that's so important to highlight within the context of relationship building, of networking, and you've highlighted it actually a couple times already, which I love. You talked about it when you were trying to get the job as far as being consistent and diligent with your follow-up. It's about being consistent with our check-ins, with our clients or our patients. It is being consistent with the way in which we're showing up. And it's not to say that we're going to have a great day all the time and that we're going to be, you know, in a perfect, there's no perfection, right? There's never any perfection. It's, it's this unattainable ideal, which that's something I'm still working on wrapping my brain around, (laughs) (laughs) but it's just about the consistency piece. It's really that. And, um, yeah, to add to what you've said and, and you highlighted again, so many great points, Um, particularly, I really loved what you said around treating everyone the same in terms of your colleagues and your leaders. Um, It's something that I think we have done a really fantastic job of at Artemis um, and something that, you know, has just really been something that's been very, very important to us within the business. You know, I am really lucky and fortunate that I have been with the business since we started, Um, actually, you know you know, almost, I've been with the business for almost six years now, which is pretty crazy. (laughs) Um, But we really had that culture of, you know, the business as the baby. And we are all responsible for nurturing this business as the baby and everyone has a voice. And I love how humble and transparent you were as well when you said, you know, this is something that I used to think about, you know, 
I, that, that my idea was the best idea because I think number one, I can relate to that being a previous, <laughs> something I used to think too. Um, and it really took, you know, a couple humblings to, to get to a point where I was like, actually, you know what, uh, you know, it, input is very important, yes. but it's easy when, you know, when you are, when you're confident, it, it can be easy sometimes yes. for us to t- just teeter a little bit into that ego. And yes. especially when we're leaders, it can be really difficult sometimes, especially with a certain personality type to trust and just let go of our white knuckle grip on the steering wheel, so to speak. I know that is, you know, it's something I have to kind of consistently remind myself of that I have an Mm -hmm. amazing team that I trust immensely that are incredibly skilled in ways that, you know, I don't have their skill sets. I don't have their experience in different realms of expertise. And I think that that's where we can also really highlight developing relationships and um, is really identifying these areas where people are very passionate and where they really shine and what they really are excited about doing and excited about bringing to the table. And as leaders, we can really start to to extricate that and nourish and allow that to flourish with them, really mentor them in that aspect. And even with our colleagues, we can provide them with opportunities that we see for them to really exercise those parts of themselves. And, you know, I think it's just a great way to, 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 to exist. And and then everybody gets to have that trajectory of growth and development. So kind of, again, moving on to a little bit of a different facet of this conversation. And because we did talk about this, this process of the hiring process and, you know, when we're reaching out. um, So for those listeners that are either on the job hunt or, you know, are going to be on the job hunt in the future, what tips would you give to, you know, make the absolute best impression from the onset of, you know, submitting your resume, submitting for an application to actually getting an interview and and beyond? What would you give as far as your tips from your experience to really make that impact and, and give yourself the best possible chance of getting the dream job? Okay, so I love getting this question. <laughs> um, but I think there's there's a couple of steps that you should take. So the first thing is, number one, isolating your resume and cover letter. If Are people even still doing cover letters? I don't know. But if the job <laughs> requests a cover letter or it says, like, recommended, you probably should have one. But it's really important to tailor your resume to each job posting that you are applying for if you're sending just like a generic resume or like it's your general resume that you send for every application sometimes with the softwares they're so advanced now if they don't have certain keywords in them they're not going to even be seen by a recruiter so it's really really important that you're looking through some of those job descriptors or what your responsibilities or those adjectives are and making sure to kind of Um, weave that in into your application and for the things that are applicable. It's also really important to make sure that you're highlighting any type of, you know, accolades that you've received or any type of like management or leadership roles Mm -hmm. to really kind of hone in on that. Um, That's basically like some people are like, well, maybe it's not as relevant or they don't want to or they don't want to put it in for whatever reason, but your resume and your cover letter are your time to brag and sell yourself. Literally, when you're applying for jobs, it's your time to sell yourself. And if you cannot sell yourself, why would someone like, you have to be attractive. So it's like a think of yourself as a product. They have to want to buy you. <laughs> that sounds bad, <laughs> but like, you have to like, you have to sell it. So it's a little bit of salesy almost, but I would say really making sure to tailor your resume and fine tuning and understanding what are soft skills versus hard skills. Mm, So so understanding, um, you know, communication and communicating and be able to um, not communicate even on like, obviously verbally, but also being a good um, nonverbal communicator, being Mm -hmm. good via like email and like kind of fine tuning those skills and always maintaining a level of professionalism. I know as we, you know, change and different societal norms change, like right now, I think Gen Z, they probably don't really dress up for interviews. Mm -hmm. It's important that you want to put your best foot forward. Mm. So it's important to still like, because a lot of people are not dressing up, 
Mm. You should dress up, put on a suit, put on, you know, a nice tailored dress and some heels and have, you know, resumes in hand, not only printed out copies, but also have virtual copies as well. Mm. It's also really important to make sure that you are fine tuning. And this is something that like I've had to continue to do, but like be really active on LinkedIn, Mm -hmm. treat that almost as like a social media. And it's so hard because like, it doesn't seem like it's as fun as, you know, TikTok and Instagram, but there's a lot of connections and information that is readily accessible directly on LinkedIn. So when you treat it that way, you're able to find new opportunities. You're able to connect with new people Mm -hmm. and even create like opportunities, not only for jobs, but even for like, you know, volunteer or other, just other options in general. So really fine tuning LinkedIn, but not only using LinkedIn as a single source of applying. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people like to just use like maybe it's Indeed or LinkedIn, but kind of diversifying where you are applying. Mm -hmm. And then I would also say making sure to arm yourself with the information about the companies that you are applying to. So it's so, 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 so important that you do research on what are, what is the vision of the company? What's the mission? What does leadership look like? What do they offer? Do you stand behind? Mm. Are you aligned with their values? Because if it's not, you probably won't stay very long. So Mm -hmm. make sure that you're not just applying to jobs just as like out of a whim. It's like, oh, okay, sure. It'd be fun. You won't be fulfilled there for very long. So then you'll be back on the job hunt. So it's really important Mm. to find brands that are aligned with your similar values um, because inevitably most job, most jobs will ask you, you know, what do you know about the company? And so right. that's your time to like pull things out of your research. Like I saw that you guys, you know, won this award or you have mm-hmm. this device and I really love that. So it's really a time to show what you know, because if you haven't taken the time to do research for the company, why would they be interested? It's like, oh, I just applied because I saw it as a position. And it's kind of like, you didn't really do your homework. <laughs> so it's, right. it's really important to to kind of do that research. And then also an extra little push step would be to connect with someone from that mm-hmm. team on LinkedIn. So whether mm-hmm. that's like sending them a message like, hey, um, I would love to connect on X, Y, and Z. Start off as just like a, a reaching out or like a reaching out for like an olive branch more so to speak, not just for that job, but pre- creating relationships within mm-hmm. that specific company. But also this is why it's important to be a part of other organizations and really work on networking even while if you're in some type of postgraduate school or mm-hmm. technical school, really utilizing the people who are there as your network because you never know who other people know or who who they are. So really utilizing friends as a network because they can get mm-hmm. you into doors that you can have the best job application, the best resume, but if you have a stronger network and you're mm-hmm. able to like know people who are already in that company, it gives you higher leverage. So it's really important to make sure that you're fostering relationships and not only using that person. So reaching mm. out to them, you know, periodically, Hey, how are you doing? I haven't, you know, heard from you in a while and just check up just on a friend level to get to know like what they're doing. You talk about what you're doing, but if you're reaching out more so of just like, I need you, I need you, I need you. That's not, that's not networking. That's kind of like you're using that person. So it's important right. to build a rapport with yes. the people so that if another job opportunity does come up too, they're seeking out for you. So that way you're not necessarily having to look. Um, and then I would also say my final tidbit is making sure that you come armed with questions. Questions mm. are huge. Um, it's important that you, that you're wanting to know like what, what have people in this previous role done to have been successful? What are some attributes that you look for? What would be required of me to, you know, fulfill like day to day? What is the company's goals five years from now, 10 years from now? What is the trajectory for, mm. um, you know, self-improvement or even growing with the, within the company? What does that look like? Those, so a treated interview is not only, you know, you're interviewing for the job, but you're also interviewing that company. Is mm-hmm. it a good fit for you? Because if it's not, then you can also say, no, I decline as well. And I think a a big thing as well that a lot of people get a little, um, I guess, weary from is when you're applying to jobs and you're looking at the description of what you actually have to do. If you're able to do at least 30% of those things, even 20% of those things, you should still apply. 
because most of it is going to be on job training. You will learn <laughs> as you get into it. Oh, so you 100%. don't have to be, if you can do everything that's in that description, you're overqualified for the position already. Wow. So. <laughs> Such great wisdom. Honestly, Nakrae, you have hit on almost everything that I would say as well. I think just to recap there, you know, again, just having been on, on both sides, um, both sides, you know, from seeking jobs to um, being a hiring manager now for, you know, seven, almost, almost seven years, essentially. Um, I would say that when I am looking at applicants for any role, what I look for to your point are, are number one, that bespoke element of the resume and the cover letter. If I see that it's sort of an auto application, I'm way less incentivized, right? Exactly. To, to spend the time, you know, to, to go through that because I can see that the time has not been reciprocally spent on the other side. And so I am so much more incentivized, especially if I get a personal reach out on LinkedIn, if I get a, a personalized email, um, and if someone really, to your point, has done their research and doesn't just send me again a, a copy and paste sort of form letter, but they really have sort of looked into the business, understand what our mission is and have spoken to their own experience and what they think they could bring to the table. So I think it's so important that you highlighted those points from the onset. I think also you highlight such a great point around networking in general that I think is so, so valuable for us to highlight in this episode, which is when we are building out our network, when we are building out relationships of any capacity, we have to make sure that it's reciprocal energy. So we cannot just be seeking people out that we want to use and leverage. It really should be a genuine, genuine, sort of back and forth where Absolutely. we're looking to offer and we're looking to receive. Um, so I think that that's so important as well, because that is a way that I've seen relationships fall apart in, mm -hmm. in business and in, you know, personal. in personal Absolutely. settings from friends, um, you know, from, for myself in my own past, you know, it is, it's a, it's a mistake that's easy to fall into sometimes because, things get busy. We, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of forget sometimes, but it really is something that's so important when yes. we are building out our network and throughout the hiring process as well. The other thing that I would say is the most important thing for me is to your point, somebody coming into the interview armed with knowledge about the business, armed with questions. I, I as a hiring manager, I love to feel like I'm being interviewed and like mm -hmm. I have to pitch Artemis um, mm -hmm. to you know the, fo the folks that I'm interviewing because it challenges me as the hiring manager. And when they're asking those types of questions, I also can see that this is somebody that really is valuing longevity and yes. value alignment. And so those are two things that I really encourage people, you know, I always, when I'm talking to anyone who's looking for a job, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that they're looking for a job, not out of a place of desperation where they are, are out of a job, but whether, right. where they're kind of just, you know, obviously there are different situations just depending on where you're at, but if you can be looking for a job without that desperation and without that kind of scarcity mindset, it's mm -hmm. so um, impactful to take your time to know that you don't have to just snatch up the first thing that you get if it's not value aligned for you. Because to your point, the longevity is not going to be there and likely you're not going to be the best fit because the best fit is going to be someone that's very, very passionate about that work right. and that feels more aligned with the mission. And I would also say that when you're interviewing, see how you get along with the people, you know, really see, especially if you're interviewing with your, with the hiring manager, who's going to be working with you, really mm -hmm. see how you, how you get on with that person. Um, and just, you know, see how that feels because the people at a company change everything. So, you know, it's really important that you also feel really bought in to the people in the company when you're going throughout that process. So 100%. to kind of cap this off and, you know, kind of talk through what I would see as, as the, this last phase of, of networking is when we're out there and we're networking with, you know, we're in our job or we're working for ourselves and, 
you know, we're going out into the world and we are, we're networking within our industry or we're networking and trying to build relationships um, as far as, for example, in our case, potentially manufacturer contacts mm-hmm. or um, strategic account contacts or product partnership contacts. What is your, um, you know, kind of what is your advice there as far as how to not only kind of nurture those de- those relationships from the beginning of their development, kind of secure the relationship and also continue to foster it. So what would you say from, from those three levels? Because again, this will apply across everything that we've talked about, but just mm-hmm. to synthesize it all and, and really talking about some of these, these bigger fish relationships, you know, all Absolutely. relationships to me should be treated the, in the same way with the same level Absolutely. of respect to your point before. But, you know, when we're talking about these kind of high stake relationships, what would you advise there? Yeah. And I think that's a great point is the the approach is, or you treat them the same, but the approach is a little different. So I think that for like manufacturers or product partnerships, one thing that I really try to do, and I think we kind of, you kind of hit on it a little bit. um, Well, we kind of hit on it throughout this whole conversation, but is making sure that things are reciprocal. So Um, And I'm going to circle back around to that. But the first thing that I really make sure to do is that I have as much information as possible on that um, partner, whether it's like devices, it's information, I'm armed with information so that when I'm having conversations with them, I don't look like uneducated on the topic Mm -hmm. that I'm presenting or talking to them about. I make sure to also ask very thoughtful questions and make sure to maximize and be respectful of their time. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I really don't like having to like go back and forth without, um, because then it looks like, you know, you're, you're not properly prepared. It looks like you're kind of scattered. So I like to make Mm -hmm. sure that everything is organized Mm -hmm. and I like to make sure that I'm also flexible. So whether it's, you know, changing meetings, if it has to be last minute or it's like super early in the morning, if you know me, I hate being up super, super early, but sometimes we have, you know, manufacturers who are on the opposite side of the world. So Mm -hmm. getting up for an early morning is something that has to be done. So being flexible within those parameters, but also when we talk about, being reciprocal one thing that's so important with any relationship is if you can't pour from a dry well so Mm -hmm. making sure that as they are giving me information or giving me the information that i need or training that i need to equip like the rest of the team with i'm also providing feedback so Mm -hmm. if it's feedback on what can be improved or feedback on what's really done well i think that's Mm -hmm. important to provide but also just creating relationships. So not making it only about business all the time. It's important to meet people where they're at and to also allow people the space to talk about them. People, if you give them the opportunity, people love to talk about themselves. They love it. Most, Most people love to talk about themselves. So what I try to do, and this is like a constant inner battle because I'm one of those people and I love to talk about myself is I try to temper myself and listen. So just Mm. listening to like, you know, they say if we if we're starting a conversation and we're having a meeting and maybe they've mentioned like, oh, you know, I have to do this this weekend. I'm going to ask questions Mm -hmm. about, you know, what are you doing? What are your plans? Ask Mm -hmm. about maybe family or maybe if something happened, you know, the week prior, I'm going to follow up next week. How did that go? I heard you're getting married. Like, I wish you the best sending cards, sending, but really making sure that like it's a actual relationship and treating it as such. And not just getting on the calls and like, okay, business. Because Correct. then it's then it's just not it's not a good relationship from that point. I mean it's it's a business relationship, but it's not going to be a long lasting or a, a a really strong relationship. So I try to make sure that it's a it's kind of an intermingle of both. Let's be I wanna know about you personally, and I wanna also, you know, make sure that this partnership is beneficial, mutually beneficial. Um, and then also checking in, I think, is another thing that's huge about about like what what would you say is a successful partnership for, yeah. you know, on our end as well as on your end? What does that look like? What can we do better? Really kind, kind of trying to push the envelope to always make improvements or changes to be better, I think is mm-hmm. a great thing. But also, once again, I always circle back to authenticity of being true to you and also yes. making sure that that shines through and just being a light being bubbly really is, is kind of what I try to, try to do. 
Well, and I think that that's, it's this infectious energy, right? And it, I think that when we communicate in this way, that's authentic. And to your point, when we come armed and prepared and really when we come mission driven, I think is a really important point I want to highlight is really understanding and really tuning into your own personal value system and how you are channeling that through your professional work and that then really informing so much of the relationship building that we're doing, because if, you know, my personal value system is about improving people's lives and making them feel and making them feel more confident, making them feel better about themselves, making them, um, you know, just feel, have more fun, feel more excited, um, feel lighter and feel seen and heard. Mm -hmm. And so if I know that, that those are my personal values, I'm going to bring that into everything that I do. It's going to come into play in my personal life. It will come into play in my professional life. And I think that to your point, you just strike this beautiful balance where you are maintaining these relationships and you're the bud of relationships comes from that intermingling of the personal and the professional to your point, because it can't be all of either. If it's all personal, then we we're not going to get anything done. And the collaboration aspect is not going to be there. If it's all professional, then to your point, it, we're building a relation. We're not really building a relationship because a relationship is, you know, again, this is something my mentor says, a relationship is a relay. Like that's the, Mm, it's the basis of the word. It's a relay. And that's where we talk about reciprocity and we talk about the importance of that. And I absolutely share what you've said. You know, I think that when I have developed high level, high stakes relationships, the personal aspect of them has been so crucial. And Mm -hmm. I think that the tip that I would give to our listeners is really find the connection point. Find your point of connection because no matter who you are talking to, no matter where they are from, you will have a point of connection. And it may be Absolutely. it may be sense of humor. It may be mm-hmm. um, a sport that you both like to watch. Mm-hmm. It may be, you know, a, a movie that you love. It, it can be these kind of niche points, but find your point of connection and then yes. really talk about that, ask more about it and be genuinely interested. And and to your point about active listening, you know, similarly, you know, as you know, I think um, I mentioned this earlier, but because I was so shy growing up, I have this theory that that's why I talk so much now and making, <laughs> making up for lost time. But I do practices actively, um, meditation and, and community, meditation community being one of them, where there are practices of active listening, where you really take yourself back and you really ask questions. And another really amazing thing, God, I'm just, I love my mentor so much and I'm realizing how much I just adore her. I have many mentors, but I I just, I'm quoting her a lot in this episode. Um, So, which just speaks back to the importance of finding our (laughs) expanders, finding our mentors, because they have such influence on us. But she says the most interesting person in the room is the most interested person in the room, meaning that you asking questions and just sitting and getting people to talk about themselves and share about themselves, that is how you start to develop relationships. And it's Mm -hmm. also how people really want to be around you because you're genuinely interested in what they have to say. And so this is where the authenticity piece comes back as well, because we want to make sure that, you know, we're asking questions that we're genu- genuinely interested to hear the answers to, and that we're really listening when people are talking. And to your point that, you know, I'll give an example. One of the manufacturers that we have at Artemis that I've personally been working with for seven years now, um, you know, I it, it's gotten to the point where we... Every year we send each other holiday messages on WhatsApp. I check in with him and see how his son's tennis lessons are going. You know, he sends me adorable pictures of his puppy because he knows how much I love dogs. Um, (laughs) We talk about Formula One. So we've developed this relationship where also when I need, you know, to ask him for something professionally, there is that relationship that's been built and we're able to right. work in, in a way that's much more collaborative because we have this 
this very strong basis of the relationship. So that's just one thing I'll kind of leave off with um, to this point. But I think, again, we we keep coming back to a few key threads that I think I want to highlight. Number one is consistency. So yes. it's being consistent and diligent with not only our behavior and how we show up in the world, but also in our communication. Mm -hmm. So consistency being one point, the next point being authenticity. So really tapping into what who you are, number one, what your personal values are, what your personal mission is, and how you're shining that through in your professional life and in your personal life as well. Number three being um, just ensuring that we are finding those connection points and really listening. So I think that that's another piece as well. And fourth, but certainly probably the most important is mutual respect and reciprocity. So making sure that we are really operating with integrity at all times, really holding ourselves to that esteem of operating with integrity. When we operate from integrity, no matter what external factors are going on that we may or may not have control over, we can always feel good and whole in the fact that we are operating with integrity. I think it's just such an important thing to just really feel into and just really bet in and and make sure that we're operating with integrity in not only our professional lives, but our personal lives as well, because it will just shine through in everything that we do. Yes. So, Nakre, this has been a fantastic conversation. Yes. So many great insights from you on this particular topic. Um, so glad to have had you on the podcast and <laughs> can't wait for many more episodes to come. Are th- is there anything else that you want to share on, on this topic or any topics adjacent uh, before I l- ask you the last question that we ask to all of our guests here on Glow & Tell? I'd say... The biggest thing is, because we talked a lot about like making sure you're confident, having these, you know, touch points of listening and, but sometimes it might be hard to do those things and creating long lasting and fruitful relationships require a lot of self work. So I think Mm -hmm. the first point is, you know, finding out what you need to work on, whether that's actively listening, maybe you don't like to listen or you listen to just respond instead of to actually understand that's like, a huge thing I'm constantly working through. And I don't, I don't think all these things that we're talking about is something that someone is, you know, a hundred percent master at or expert at, but I think it's important to self-identify or just identify what you have to specifically work on to make sure that you have the most fruitful relationships. I think that's such an amazing point to end on and, and something that I think is so important in every aspect of life is to really, yeah, identify what we have to work on and also giving ourselves that grace and yes. knowing that we won't be perfect. Perfect yes. is not possible, but that it's a journey to, to our point before. And it's, it's a journey that we're always traveling. There, there is no destination. The journey is the destination in, in this way. So I think that's just such a beautiful way to cap us off. Um, I do have one note that I want to also add and cap us off with, which is if you are looking for jobs, please do send thank you notes after interviews if you want to get the job. I will tell you as a hiring manager, getting that thank you note via email or, you know, however you're sending it, it is a personal touch that is so appreciated and it really does show that you're invested in moving forward within that process. So that's just one little additional tidbit that I wanted to make sure I threw in there because I had forgotten to say it earlier. Nakre, thank you so much. I'm going to ask you our last question that we asked okay. all of our guests, which is what does beauty mean to you personally? So this is like probably a whole podcast. On <laughs> own, but I'll be brief. Um, I think for me, beauty, well, I won't say I think beauty for me is not only outward beauty, but also inward beauty. And so mm. what that looks like is loving yourself in totality and not conforming to what society says you should be, what anyone says you should be knowing and having that confidence of who you are, of how you look and standing true to that. So um, making sure that, you know, however is whatever beautiful is to you, that you're presenting that physically, but also doing the self work inside to make sure that 
that is also beautiful as well because you can have a lovely package and the inside of the contents be t- just terrible. So mm. I think the first step for beauty is making sure the inward beauty is there and then everything else from that point will flow and do not conform and do not be um I guess enticed by what media says beautiful Mm -hmm. is because there are so many different visions or ideas of beauty and beauty is also in the eye of the beholder so everybody is beautiful when you have the full package of both inward and outward beauty that is true beauty Mm. Love that. Thank you so much, Nakray. And thank you so much for your incredible humility and transparency on this episode. I think it, it's just so amazing. I always love chatting to you as you can you know, imagine from the time <laughs> that we started talking about three plus hours ago. Um, but we will surely be having you back for future episodes. Cannot wait because there's so much for us to talk about. Um, this has just been such a great episode. So thank you so much for joining us and listeners we will see you next time for another episode of glow and tell see you next time have a great rest of your week thank you for listening to glow and tell please like subscribe comment and follow anywhere where you listen to podcasts we'll see you next time